Fred Ricciani, the Sports Courier Podcast, TSC News. We have right here via Zoom a very special guest. He is a former UFC and Bellator fighter, a well-respected MMA veteran, and now he is currently saving lives in the front lines of the COVID-19 outbreak in New York City. We are talking to Philippe Nover. Philippe, how's everything going? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Doing all right, man. Uh, it's good to see you safe. It's good to see you sound. I would imagine it's been a, a crazy couple of months for you. I, I guess for anybody that's not up to speed on what you've been up to lately since you retired from mixed martial arts, can you let everybody know what's going on? Uh, well, uh, besides having an MMA career, I was always a, I was always a nurse. And uh, I've actually worked in the ER initially back in 2005 to 2007 or eight, And then quit nursing, went into fighting full time. Then I uh, balanced all, balanced it all out and continued fighting along with being a registered nurse. And I've been uh, working in a, in a Brooklyn hospital in the cardiac cath department for the almost about 10 years now. So, and uh, New York uh, right now, I mean, um, as of today, we're having a, a pretty good downtick in uh, COVID patients and, um, I'm actually back in the cath lab covering cardiology patients like I originally was assigned. And I'm glad that we're, we're experiencing a lower, lower COVID-19 admissions. I'd imagine, though, initially it got pretty crazy. You talked to MMA Fightings, Damon Martin, about that and everything. I mean, how, how fast did it go from zero to 100? Uh, probably in about from a week or two. I'd say it was uh, early March to mid March was like when it just went zero to a hundred, uh, where we were already, uh, our hospital luckily was, uh, we had, uh, I would say adequate PPE for the most part. We did ration it and, um, we were responsible with who's going to get it and how we're going to use it. Uh, that's the uh, personal protective equipment, like masks, gowns, gloves, uh, those things. And, we were ready. We had meetings. I remember that a uh, few weeks we said, listen, we're going to have, uh, you know, COVID-19 patients possibly we're preparing for an outbreak and um, our management, and our team was ready. Uh, we were cross uh, began our cross training scenario where I was going to be deployed to the emergency room. And uh, some of my colleagues were going to be deployed to the rapid response code team, which I did both pretty much. Um, and, uh, I remember when we even said like, oh, we have one COVID-19 patient in the hospital and like no one could know about it until another like just a week or two after that. It was just like full blown 95 percent of the hospital was COVID-19 um, and all the units that were originally just isolation. It was pretty much reverse. It was like one, maybe like five beds were not COVID and everything else is COVID. So it's like. It was like almost no way to control and contain it at one point. Um, but uh, luckily, um, as, as you probably see and everyone's watching the news, you see that uh, we're on this uh, plateau and now we're on the down end. So we're just trying to keep that going. You fought some killers over the years in mixed martial arts. But when you got into nursing, I would imagine you thought, OK, I'm going to be saving lives. But you probably didn't realize, oh, my God, I may have to fight for my own life in this uh, different arena. Was there ever a point in time over the last couple of months where you thought, oh, man, like I'm, I'm legitimately worried about my safety? I um, I would say there were definitely points in time where I was worried that I would contract this, um, this respiratory illness and um, get sick, especially I would say more so when I had people that I know get sick and uh, even colleagues of mine because we are uh, at the hospital technically on the front line. So uh, that's pretty scary, but nothing compared to when I stepped into a cage to fight a professional fighter who was trying to kick my head off. I think that's pretty, that was scary as enough. I know um, you probably want to know which is scarier. I would say <laughs> that's a bit more scary. Uh, I would say, uh, but both of the times I'm pretty focused and um, just applying the skills that I learned to, to the, what task is uh, needed. So even when I'm in the COVID unit, uh, when I formerly was running around like a, like a crazy man during these codes and, and um, being part of the team, it, it was difficult, but I always made sure that I had my, my mask on. I had my gown on, always washing my hands. Uh, it was a routine where I would um, pretty much just 
constantly be washing and, you know, removing my shoes in my car and like just very cautious. Uh, I've definitely uh, loosened up since then. Uh, now that there's a downturn, um, you know, but we'll see what happens. Uh, based on your estimation and your direct experience, what was the age range of the patients you primarily had at the hospital? I would say that the primary age was uh, 50 and up. Uh, 60 and 70 would have probably an increase in mortality. And if you have uh, uh, comorbidities, something minor like high blood pressure, diabetes, if you add that on top. And I've actually had a lot of overweight, obese patients that um, were actually younger, which was um, surprising. Um, usually like 99% of these people have comorbidities than are older, but there are some, there are a few that we do see that have no comorbidities and they just had sort of like the poor luck of the draw. Um, it's, it's pretty scary to think that, especially, um, being a young, healthy person like myself and, you know, but there are a very, very, uh, sm- there are chances that a young, healthy person can get sick from this. And and it can be fatal. But for the most part, um, we're seeing uh, older folks. So the good news is things are starting to plateau a bit. Obviously, you know, the country needs testing and tracing, needs you know more tests, and obviously, eventually, some real reliable treatment and a cure. But the, the on the bad side of things, Governor Cuomo's talked about how there's this kind of mysterious illness now that's affecting kids. And I don't know if you've dealt with any kids directly in your unit or you know any colleagues have, but ha- have you seen anything like this lately? And, and kind of ha- has uh, it grown or, or something that we should be on the lookout for throughout the country? Uh, I definitely would always be on the lookout for um, any childhood illness like that. I haven't personally seen it. I've spoken to colleagues and I've watched the news as well. Um, this is um, some sort of similar disease that we all learned in nursing school. And, and I know physicians uh, probably learned it in medicine, but it's something that you rarely see in the Kawasaki uh, disease, which is, uh, it's very rare. And there is some some uh, a correlation, it seems, with these viruses and, pa- and, and pediatric patients presenting with it. But as far as my personal experience, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't quite know as much information and I haven't witnessed it. So I'm not in peds. That, that takes a different level of heart, I think. <laughs> I can't handle that. Have you seen people that have recovered that end up having pre-existing conditions after this, any permanent lung damage or anything like that? I, or for the most part, yeah, you've seen I, people fully recover? Yeah, for the most part, uh, I've seen uh, people fully recover. I've, I've had colleagues and friends that got it and they quarantined themselves at home um, and were lucky. And it takes a while, even when you're sort of recovered, uh, I know that they're still kind of fatigued. They're not like going out and working out. I mean, they're not as active as I am. So I wouldn't be able to gauge it because um, luckily I haven't gotten it. But uh, as far as long term effects, you're right. We really don't know, um, especially uh, reinfection rates. We don't know about that. Um, so could you possibly get sick again with this disease? Um, with another strain of it? Uh, is it mutating? There's so many questions and so many variables that we're only uh, learning day to day and collecting the data on. So, um, but as far as like uh, my immediate friends and who've contracted it, they, who've had fully recovered, they, they're pretty much back at their normal, uh, normal state of being. Now, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you're a jujitsu black belt. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I actually got my black belt, uh, back in 2008 or nine. That was under Soka, Alexander Soka. And since then, I've been training at uh, Henzo Gracie in New York City, and uh, Henzo just gave me my third degree uh, black belt. Congrats. So, I mean, I love, yeah, I love, I love jujitsu. It's one sport I'm still active in. Before this pandemic, I was still active. So, so yeah. being an, still being an athlete to this day, being a jujitsu black belt under Henzo Gracie, no less. How much does it suck to not be able to roll with the guys and <laughs> keep your skills sharp? Wow. Yeah, the last time I rolled was was. Oh my God, it's been months. And, and I know some of the guys are training still um, and, and that's their career and that's their profession and enjoyment. Um, but it's just for me to go down there um, and, and have to, you know, it's, it's, too, it's too high risk, especially I could be a carrier and someone gets sick, you know, obviously it would be me to blame. So I don't want to be uh, showing up at the gyms and training on the down low and, and, contracting, I mean, and, and 
getting other people sick. You know, this is pretty much jujitsu is pretty much the most contact you can ever get with someone in any sport. You're literally on top of each other, sweating, each, <laughs> sweating each other's faces. So it's like, there's no, uh, there's no barrier. Um, so, you know, this is going to be a tough sport that people will have to be confident to come back and train. And, and I hope that we can in time do that. Do you think it's ill-advised for the UFC to continue to run shows? Now, full disclosure, from what I understand, UFC is doing two types of COVID tests on top of everything to do with USADA, and I give them a lot of props for that. They're certainly doing more than WWE and, and some other organizations are still running, but obviously there, there is still a risk. If, they, if, they, if Dana White gave you a call randomly out of blue and said, hey, man, you know, is this a good idea? What would you tell him? I say it's a great idea. This is a wonderful idea um, uh, from multiple perspectives. Uh, first of all, there's a risk. There's risks in everything. And you're dealing with athletes. We're dealing with fighters. Uh, obviously, it's a high risk situation. Um, I remember uh, speaking to another journalist and he asked me the same question. And I said, if Dana White wants to throw a, a UFC, if if he can get everyone tested, um, you know, have everyone uh, temperature tested, have COVID-19 nasal tests and even further, if they want to do blood tests and people come out negative and they're not sick, then let the healthy people uh proceed to uh to to compete so and he that's what he did actually so i think that this is uh from one perspective it's a it's that's a great idea and from a business perspective we're looking at no sports on television at all right now <laughs> so um anything we could throw on there would be a, would a great a great opportunity for the ufc and i know all the fighters who fought on the card were will, willing and able and they even said that you know, a lot of them were interviewed and they said, listen, I'm, I'm here. If I was uh, sick or I need a quarantine, I'll do that. But right now they also have a living. They have to have to, they also um, make a living doing this and um, hats off to the guys who went out there. And, and actually I, I do believe in the first um, Florida fight that they had, uh, Jacare tested positive And so two of his cornermen. So it's good. They nipped it in the butt and they, uh, they quarantined and, Furthermore, no, it doesn't look like there was anyone who got sick or, or any issues. And I, I think that as we move forward, which we really have to do um, as uh, in the United States, we have to move forward. We have to get businesses going again. Um, and uh, little by little, like this month, we're opening up, you know, but it's just got to be smart and um, and regulated sort of. I really appreciate that perspective, by the way, because, again, you're somebody that's on the front lines, but you're also a former UFC fighter, and you could uh, speak intelligently uh, about this. And, you know, at first, I was one of those people that was very apprehensive and was like, okay, this is a really bad idea. But when I saw they were testing, I said, you know what? You know, this could possibly work. And from what you're saying, I mean, that makes a a lot of sense. I think here's the thing that I think a lot of people might retort, right? And, And even people that aren't necessarily MMA fans, it's like, okay, it's great that all these fighters, all this staff, all these corner men, can all get tested. They get multiple tests. If they're negative, they can fight, they can participate, whatever. But meanwhile, in the rest of the United States, for the average civilian, it, it's hard to even get a test, even if you're symptomatic. So, yeah, and yeah. obviously New York's di- New York, New Jersey, where we're at, it's a lot different from, you know, a rural yes. area or other states that may not have the access to the type of testing that we have here in, in the tri-state area. So, Realistically speaking, I mean, we're neither of us are politicians, decision makers, anything like that. But realistically speaking, what would it take for, say, like a state like New York, New Jersey, or Texas, whatever, to safely be able to reopen up? Is it? Do we have to get to the point where we have sanitizing stations like China? Uh, I think there's going to be. Obviously, it's it's never going to be the same. I tell you that much. Yeah. Uh, we already know that, and um, it's going to take massive testing. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, people are going to be. Uh, it's, it's not going to be uh, the same uh, amount of people allowed in businesses. You know, the occupancy levels will be le- definitely different. Um, and, and there will be a certain amount of population who aren't um, cool with going out anymore. They might not want to go into a restaurant and sit down and have someone else prepare their food. Um, so, so we're seeing different things happening. And then also it's even from a, from a business perspective where people have to go into an office, maybe – Half the people never even had to go into the office and they could do everything from afar. So there's definitely going to be different things going on as far as uh, what our country is going to look like. Um, is it going to be like sanitation um, uh, facilities like like they have in China? That's that's very possible. I mean, everyone's Purelling and everyone's running around with masks now. I know uh, China had SARS, uh, SARS-1 SARS um, and, and MERS at one point in, in different parts of Asia and the Middle East. And they're right now, they were a few steps ahead, I think, because they had these uh, 
these mass outbreaks. And now we're, I've never see, thought that I'd see Americans and New Yorkers wearing a mask uh, all over. So we might have, if we open up the subway again, I mean, like, how are we going to enter the subway? We were like packed in there like sardines before. That's, that can't happen anymore. Um, so we're definitely going to see a culture change. Um, businesses, a lot of them will not reopen. Um, and uh, it, it'll take, I th honestly think it might take, uh, to go back to normal, it will take a few years, even if it, you consider it normal. For sure. And I think too, especially like in New York where I mean, I, I worked in Soho up until this, this outbreak, I mean, all these pizzerias, all these different restaurants I and mean, yeah, maybe they could operate under 25% capacity, half capacity or only operate takeout only. But at the end of the day, those businesses weren't built on operating at only half capacity or operating at, at takeout yeah. only. You know what I mean? And there's still that overhead yeah. and that rent. So yeah. And I think even with, with the skyscrapers, a lot of these companies might say, you know what, it's easier for us to not renew or lease in these buildings, send people home, let them work from home. They'll be more productive. And then all of a sudden, while there might still be some tourists and stuff like that, NYC kind of more or less still becomes a ghost town. Yeah, it's, it's possible. I think that um, that can happen in the next few years until we probably see um, the vaccine come out. That's a huge thing. I know they're having this, uh, uh, this vaccine uh, uh, pretty much that they're trying to streamline to the end of the year saying, you know, December, tw um, uh, 2020, we might have a vaccine. And I mean, this is the fastest we, it takes four years even to get a vaccine. I mean, to, to get this fast would be pretty, pretty amazing. Um, uh, and there's risk involved too with that, because this is uh, the reason why it would take four years because you have trials and trials of people, um, to see if it works and what are the long-term effects. And we really wouldn't know. Um, and, um, so we will only have to wait and see. Besides all that we've talked about up to this point about COVID-19, are there any tips you could provide that maybe people don't think about? I mean, obviously, you know, wa don't wa you know, wash your hands, don't touch your face, wear a mask out outside, keep your distance. Is, is there anything that maybe you don't see enough people doing that's not apparent that should be on top of mind? Um, I mean, yeah, you, you pretty much said it. Um, you know, just being more, more over aware. Of, of what's going on in your surroundings, keeping a distance from people um, in public areas. Um, that, that's really important. Uh, always washing hands. I mean, as a nurse, I mean, I wash my hands constantly, constantly. It's, it's like never enough. Um, th those things are all important. So you, you pretty much, you pretty much said it. If, if you do feel sick too, you got to just, this is the time where you really, really got to be on top of it and not expose yourself to other people. Cause the, the, uh, the way, to, to prevent this disease from spreading is from one sick person to the other. So if you feel sick, um, just don't go out, you know? And, and when you're, and if you are sick, God forbid, you do think you have the virus, you have similar symptoms. I mean, what's the point where you should go to the hospital? Is it, holy crap, yeah. I can't breathe. I got to, I got to hit up an ambulance or is it before that? Yeah. Like if you notice, like say you don't have a sensor taste or smell, which is one of the symptoms, is that when you should say, oh crap, hit the alarm? Let's no, go to don't not, do, I mean, at this point, I feel like you can, because we have the facilities to, to, um, to see these patients, um, who have mild symptoms. But, uh, at this point we do, uh, a lot of the hospitals in New York have, have a, a low census, so you can come in and get treated, but, um, and then probably get sent home and just have a sense of confidence. But if you're really having symptoms that, that are mild, I think that the only thing is that's going to cu cure you is time. So it's self-limiting this disease. Uh, the only time you really should come in is when you really have difficulty in breathing. Um, that is, uh, one of the huge, huge, uh, factors there that can, um, and the way you test that is, Sort of, um, if you if your fever is also uncontrollable, uh, if it's very high, even with Tylenol, uh, taking that a number of times a day and it still doesn't come down, and you should come to the hospital. So, difficulty in breathing. If you have a little um, saturation, uh, finger saturation thing, the so, some people have them. They bought them online now, and if it's you know if it's less than ninety five percent, that's that's an indication as well. So. You know, um, I remember uh, over six weeks ago, a month ago, we weren't even testing people because we didn't have enough tests and they had all the symptoms. And we bas basically said, listen, we're not going to test you. You're going to go home and quarantine and and it's just going to run its its course. And these were, you know, usually younger people with without any uh, comorbidities and we, we, they, were, they were pretty stable, but just frightened. Just a lot of people were frightened. Yeah, understandable. And hey, good, great again, great, great information, man. And 
Are you and any of your colleagues worried about a potential second wave? That's what we're hearing about now. We've kind of plateaued. We've flattened the curve. Obviously, there's still a lot of cases. Unfortunately, still a lot of deaths in, in the country. But it, it, things are getting better. Are you worried about the winter time? Uh, I, I would say that anything is possible. And if I honestly had to pick between the two, I would say we will probably experience a second wave of this, um, you know, this, this disease, uh, and whether it would it be something as, uh, as high as when we ori- originally, uh, originally saw a few, uh, months ago, um, we, it, it's yet to be known, but I think that um, the way that influenza works. And if you look at history, I think there were three waves of uh, the, the Spanish flu in 1918. There were three different waves that killed so many people. Now, now we have technology on our side um, and medicine on our side uh, uh, that's very modern. And, but at the same time, this, this virus um, mutates very fast and we might not be able to, who knows what, what can happen. Um, and how long can we shut our economy down? I mean, we are still in quarantine in New York and we're still on lockdown. There's a lot of people going out. I'm guilty of it. I can, I'm stir crazy if I, if I stay home all day. <laughs> so I, if I go out, I wear my mask, but when I see other people, there's so many people out. There's so many people. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Hopefully that that's not the case, but would, would you say too, that with, New York experience in New York specifically with New York experiencing all of this initially being kind of like the epicenter and everything. Do you think hospitals now will be better prepared? God forbid there is a second wave. Absolutely. I think, uh, hospitals now are, have, uh, have, have definitely uh, changed. So we, we hospitals before did not have the capacity of ICU level care. Um, and a lot of the hospitals, got, uh, were, uh, basically converted their entire hospital into ICU level care or, emer- or emergency. Um, so, and they also uh, hired a ton of travelers. So um, even, you know, um, New York's uh, got the, uh, the Navy boat that was there and it wasn't, it was sort of a backup and it wasn't really needed. Um, but this is like, uh, we have the, the tools. If there starts becoming an uptick, you know, what I'm really worried about and the worst possible case scenario is if uh, we start opening up um, and we get a huge uptick and we have to close it again, um, that would be that would be the, like the Great Depression. I mean, this is this is this is be this would be crazy. So that's what I know that probably the government and and Dr. Fauci and everyone is 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 worried about. So. Yeah, we, got, we definitely got to be careful. I mean, you know, you make the argument a lot of these stock prices right now are kind of inflated and everything is trying to pop everything up. And it's just, yeah, yeah there's, there, there's that, de- you know, there's definitely that that risk economically and, and of course, health wise. But again, super appreciate all the information you're, you're providing there. And not only appreciative of the information you're providing about COVID-19, but also the support you've had for a charity that I'm, all, I'm also involved with and have been for a decade now, which is a Bowling We're Kicking It. Hi, Philippe Nova here. Hi, I'm Eddie Alvarez. Bullying. Bullying. We're kicking it together. It is the, the number one anti-bullying nonprofit organization in the country. They have the only anti-bullying center, physical center, uh, in the entire country as well, uh, in New Jersey. Can you just talk about your involvement with Kicking It and the great cause that they're a part of? Great. Um, so uh, Gina Marie, um, we actually have been in contact and we've been friends for, for years. Um, even um, this is going back probably about 10 years. So throughout my career in the smaller shows, even um, even in Bellator and the UFC, they've always been supportive of my career. Um, and I actually went to their headquarters in New Jersey a couple of times. And I did like a, some cool appearances and met some of the kids. And they just have a wonderful cause. Um, and I love going there and speaking to the kids and, and you know, just uh, shining light on a situation at the, t- you know, uh, at the time where, where uh, kids were getting bullied. And it just, just just to show that it's not cool. And, and kids can be damaged mentally and physically in the long term just from some, you know, some bullying going on. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of that organization. And, and um, it's, it's a great organization. I really hope that they do okay after this outbreak and everything can go back to normal. And speaking of back to normal, let's get to some positive news. Of course, MMA, at least on the UFC side, is back up and running. You are still active in jiu-jitsu, but obviously we'll take some time to get back to normal there. So let me ask you some MMA questions. First and foremost, have you thought about going back and entering in different grappling tournaments? 
Yeah, I thought grappling would be cool. I actually did um, uh, a tournament. Actually, not a tournament. I did a grappling match. Um, uh, I would. When was that? I think it was uh, January this year. So that was really, really neat. Um, I had some fun. I went to a draw. Um, so, you know, and I've been training. I've been going to Henzo's a lot. I train with all those top killers there. And I also go to Henzo's Brooklyn and I train with a lot of killers there. And um, I'm just having fun with the sport and hoping not to get injured. So, you know, who knows uh, when we get back to normal, if I can start uh, training again. And, um, if I ever compete, it would likely just be in a grappling tournament. Or, or a or a super fight like I had earlier. Who is your dream grappling opponent? <laughs> I don't even know. I, I I'm at the point where it's got to be like uh, someone who's like a veteran fighter, uh, maybe a little older, and <laughs> is not specifically grappling. So I want to get like a maybe like a a retired UFC fighter like myself, <laughs> <laughs> like an equivalent guy, you know, and anyone from my era, you know, from the 2008 to 2015 whoever uh competed there in the lightweight division you know those guys are uh, those guys are my th- the younger guys and the strictly grapplers they they're they're pretty damn good especially at leg lock so yeah, yeah g- g- gotta be <laughs> gotta be careful there and and dude you mentioned it 2008 to like 2015 i mean from 2008 i'd say around 2011 i mean that was a major th- there was a, a wave like in the mid 2000s but i'd say like from 2008 2011 with the rise of Brock Lesnar i mean that was a huge boom period for ufc of course you got to throw in anderson silva and george rush st pierre there as well what was it like being a cog in that massive wheel at the time that was crazy i think every time i had a fight oh, um and i had uh any any like Anyone there at the at the fight, I was like amazed just to see who was on the card. I remember always researching, oh, this guy's on my card, and I would research more in my weight divisions. But it was, uh, I was obviously a fan of the sport too, and a fan of the other guys on the card. It was just amazing to meet these guys and you know and and be part of it. It was uh, crazy, crazy, crazy times. And in a weird way, you're also uniquely qualified to talk about empty arena matches because you fought on the <laughs> Ultimate Fighter, got to the finals, and ended up joining the UFC, of course, and, and later Bellator. Do you think in a weird way, the UFC actually conditioned its fans to be into these empty arena shows because of the Ultimate Fighter? I would say it's very possible. Um, you know what's weird? When I was on the Ultimate Fighter and I fought um, in the pretty much, it was like a gym. We fought on the Ultimate Fighter gym. Um, and there were, nobody was watching, but the two teams and a couple of other folks. And that was about it. <laughs> so, and I, I remember just doing great. I had, I didn't feel much pressure. I was just there. It was like another fight in the club. So, um, and, and I felt great. And then I don't think I performed as well. I think, uh, I performed pretty good, um, when I fought in front of thousands of people, but some people perform better when you're fighting in front of 20,000 people. Some people like myself, get a little nervous. Um, so that could be, that could have made a difference on both ends for the fighters. Um, and also for the, for the fans. Was that still when, and in the ultimate fighter did take away your cell phones and everything else. And you were pretty much like isolated. Cause there, there was a point in time where they did that. And then there was another time where they went live. And there was another time where they kind of relaxed the rules a little bit. So were you part of like, kind of like that old school tough where you still were cut I, off from civilization? I, I was in jailhouse tough. That's what it was. <laughs> So that, that was, uh, I remember when I gave my cell phone, I put it in an envelope and I also had, um, an I, uh, I think it was an iPod with, with like headphones and stuff. And I put it in there and, and we couldn't listen to music. I couldn't make calls. Mm-hmm. And it was like for six weeks, we didn't have TV. Um, I think it was a great experience though, because I had like no distractions whatsoever of outside life. And all I did was focus on like my training. And I, I think I made leaps and bounds when I was training there, just being focused. But I remember when I got that envelope back of my property, it's like a jailhouse property envelope. They're just like, all right, you're out of jail. Here you go. And I open it up and I'm like, and I put my headphones in and I'm like, wow, music. Oh my God, this is crazy. Like we're, all of the fighters were listening to music and we're all like, oh, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> What's the craziest, wackiest injury you've suffered in MMA? Oh man. Uh, I've had a lot of injuries. I, if I had to write a book on MMA in my career, it would be half of the pages would be on injuries. So um, I would say uh, I have a metal plate already in my neck. So that's probably the worst. Um, 
the worst injury, uh, I had actually, um, a herniated disc. I think it was C5, C6. And, uh, that was like a constant nagging pain. And then I got an MRI and back in 2010, uh, I actually had surgery. I had a total disc replacement. They went in anterior approach and, uh, now I'm like parked cyborg. And I actually, uh, took some time off and, and I started fighting again after that. So that's one of my, probably my worst injuries, but right now it's, it's not the nagging injury. I'd say later in my career, I had this nagging injury, plantar fasciitis, um, probably since about 2012, I had plantar fasciitis in one of my feet and man, it's like this, it's like this, uh, band in your foot that this, uh, it just never heals. You might think it's healed and then you go work out again. It's like, oh, there's that pain again. It's right on the bottom of your foot. Um, a lot of athletes have, mostly runners, have plantar fasciitis. And um, luckily, uh, it was all from overtraining. So now that I'm not like running and, and running miles and miles a day, I don't have plantar fasciitis. So. But I know that it's still there. It's something that's not going to heal. I think that years down the line, uh, I could possibly get some pain and inflammation there again. Uh, it actually tore, by the way, if anyone uh, knows more information. I actually tore the plantar, plantar fascia right off, and it was in the cast. <laughs> so that's how bad it was. Ouch. But would you say overall, though, I mean, you're, you're feeling pretty good three years out of the game? Oh, I, I feel great. What's what's uh, What was great is the fact that I, can, I learned so much about health and fitness while I was fighting that I, I kept that up minus the – the injuries like brain injuries and, and getting punched and kicked and a little bit of getting your arm twisted in jujitsu. But, uh, more than anything I gained, I think was the health and fitness aspect of it, which I, I kept up to date with probably more so before the pandemic. Now it's a little hard. I mean, I'm getting a little lazy. Um, but, um, I'm definitely on top of my health. Uh, I think I've always been a fan of that. Uh, even in my career in nursing, I always love learning about the human body and how it works how to stay as healthy as possible and disease free. And, and that's what I'm doing right now. What's the best piece of advice you give anybody that's going through it right now, whether it be health wise, God forbid with COVID-19, everybody obviously is, is suffering economically in, in some way, you know, what advice or, or saying has helped you keep going throughout all this chaos? I would say there's, it's, it's always going to be brighter. I mean, I think the, this, um, there's a huge uh, downturn in everything right now which is good. And, um, you know, but the economy will open up. We will see better days. Um, it's just, it's just going to take time, you know, um, just be patient and stay healthy. Awesome. And where can fans find you online? Uh, great. You can look me up on my Twitter or my Instagram. It's uh, P H I L L I P E N O V E R. And, uh, you can message me or I always answer everybody. <laughs> Give me a follower. Or like, <laughs> 